Support for this program comes from our members. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the 2015 Bloomington mayoral debate. I'm Joe Wren. One of these two candidates will be chosen as Bloomington's next mayor on November 3rd. The rules of this debate are simple. The candidate first posed the question will have up to 90 seconds to respond. The other candidate will have 60 seconds to rebut with 30 seconds for the first candidate to comment. There will be two minute opening and closing statements for each candidate. Community members submitted many of the questions that will be asked tonight and we will continue to take questions throughout the debate as time permits, so please email your questions to news at indianapublicmedia.org or call us at 1-800-987-9848. You can also tweet us at WTIU News using the hashtag BTownElex. The candidates are Democrat John Hamilton and Republican John Turnbull. John Hamilton was chosen by a coin toss to go first. Mr. Hamilton, you may begin your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Joe. It is a delight to be here. I want to thank you. I want to thank WFIU and WTIU for hosting this debate. I want to thank my opponent, John Turnbull, for his carrying the Republican standard here into this contest. And, and all of you, thank you all for being here in the audience. Thank you for listening and watching at home. We, we all appreciate your attention to this race. We're talking about the city of Bloomington and the mayor's race. Um, I'm excited about running for mayor because I want to keep the momentum going with Bloomington. We have a wonderful city. We have a city that a lot of people in other places would love to be in. Uh, some of them come visit us. My wife Dawn Johnson and I have uh, raised our kids here. I was born in Bloomington. We've raised our kids here through the public schools. Uh, it's a terrific place. But we can't rest on our laurels. We have work we need to do to make sure we keep moving ahead. For example, on jobs. You know, Bloomington, we built the very first color television in America. But we also built the last color television built in America in Bloomington. We have to keep our economy changing. That's why I want to talk about broadband internet all through the city and other ways to help jobs. We have, we have to get more sustainable. We have to lower our energy usage and be a good steward of the environment. We have to work on affordable housing. We have issues to work on together, uh, including public schools and opening up government. I've been pleased to have been a, a leader of large government organizations. I think I know how to get things done, and we'll get to talk about that tonight. We'll get to talk about where Bloomington's headed. Mostly, though, I just want to start by thanking you for, for paying attention, reminding you that the election uh, has <coughs> begun. You can vote early on West 7th Street, and you can vote uh, on Tuesday, November 3rd, is the full election day. So thanks for your attention. I'm John Hamilton, Democratic candidate for mayor, and I appreciate your vote. Okay, Mr. Turnbull. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to cover the three main factors that people vote. First, the party, then the issues, and then the person. You know, dogs, cats, streets, potholes, fire trucks, and jobs don't care what your politics are. My friend John Hamilton is a vigorous Democrat, and um, I'm okay with that. Uh, my only issue is that there are already nine, uh, it, the city council's nine zero Democratic, and I think I would be a very good balancing agent for this town, especially for a town this size. The issues we'll get into, but you'll find mine to be very practical and very real and very within the role of the mayor's job. Um, aesthetics is a big umbrella for me, as, as it is for any town. Uh, I will work to eliminate panhandling, which is a lose-lose for everyone. It goes towards addictions, and John won't do that. And I also believe in... Uh, our architecture to be uh, absolutely wonderful, it translates into a feel, and several other aesthetic issues. But the most important factor in an election, in my opinion, is the, the person. And my references are local. I've worked here for 26 years. You know how I deal with employees. You don't have to go far to ask how I deal with conflict and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to say that I would have a real problem hiring uh, someone that sent out the three mailers of Daryl Near in the primary. 
Um, I thought those were politics over ethics, and that's a real issue for me. But I'm not running to be your politician. I'm uh, not running to build my resume. I'm running to unlock people power. And this is a large workforce that hasn't uh, seen a lot of direction, a lot of coaching, and a lot of leadership. So I, I think the question is, are you okay with change, or do you want more of the same and a lot more of the same? Okay, thank you very much. Let's begin with the question portion of tonight's debate. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, we begin with you, 90 seconds. Uh, what would be your first priority if elected mayor, and then uh, what would that game plan be? Go ahead. Well, it, you know, that's a tricky question because there are always multiple things that you want to do. A mayor has to do more than one thing at a time. Um, I'll, I'll mention, I think jobs are very, very important for our community. We have terrific large employers. We have terrific small businesses in our community. But we need to keep growing private sector jobs, uh, and, and, and that's uh, job number one. I, I, I care a lot about affordable housing and education, making government work well, but all that depends a lot upon having a prosperous economy. And, um, you know, there are several things we can do. I've talked in the campaign, Bloomington needs to have community-controlled citywide broadband Internet. There are cities all across the country. There are cities right here in Indiana that are getting ahead of us in this digital infrastructure. It's like the electricity of the 21st century. Uh, we need to take the steps that we can do together. Jasper's doing it. Danville's doing it. Auburn's already done it here in Indiana. Chattanooga, Kansas City, others. We need to get gigabit speed fiber in our community, and we can do it together. There are different ways to do it. I'll work on that. Also, we can help businesses with financing. Uh, we can help the private sector finance business growth. Sometimes it's difficult for small businesses to access from the big banks, uh, and I've done that in my past, and that's something we can do. Um, all of that helps us with that kind of economy. All of that helps us become more sustainable, have the parks and rec that we want, and the quality of life that we want. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, you get 60 seconds. The first thing that I would do is assemble the most diverse, the most talented, and the most impactful senior management team this town has ever seen. My deputy mayor will be a game changer. I have no doubt about that. Um, <clears throat> person will be a home run that will help me manage this large workforce and touch your life. You have to assemble a staff of, that's very effective of department heads because those are the ones that are going to, uh, you're going to interact with as citizens, as people of the community. And, you do, and those management practices are really essential by way of building relationships. And wherever I've gone, I've built relationships by uh, making sure we're committed, making sure we all care, and then we do the right thing. And these people would be coached, and they would be very impressive, and you'd be very proud of the staff of this city. Mr. Hamilton, you have 30 seconds to comment. Well, um, I'm really proud of the city. We have 650 employees doing a terrific job. Uh, I think one of the things that's important is to set the tone uh, in, in the first thing, job being job one, but having an open city government. I've said I'm going to throw the doors of City Hall wide open. Uh, I'll have weekly meetings with folks, either myself or department heads, just to let the public know this is your government. Uh, we're going to do the very best thing we can to help jobs grow, create affordable housing, but also make sure people feel like this government belongs to you because it does belong to you. Okay, now we're going to go to the audience. We have a question now from David Keppel. Go ahead, David. Bloomington recently witnessed a horrific attack on an Islamic woman wearing a headscarf. What will you do as mayor to make Bloomington a safer, more inclusive city for its most vulnerable residents of all races, faiths, and ethnic backgrounds. Okay, and Mr. Turnbull, you go first, 90 seconds. Well, I do, uh, I agree with John on that. You do set the tone. Um, I do think that assembling a diverse staff that does encompass a lot of uh, diversity, whether it be religious, political, race, uh, gender, um, <clears throat> I think that is very important in the training and the outlook of how it is. And, you know, the police force is really critical in that situation. Um, they have to be highly skilled and highly trained. And I think that really filters down to the interaction that every citizen has with uh, the police force. I, I think you have to come out strong and you can't uh, support and, and act like that. 
Um, my understanding is that um, it, the, the individual that perpetrated it was not a part of an organized group. Uh, hopefully it was an isolated incident. It sounds like it was, but certainly in the investigation uh, we will find out. I think you have to be calm, you have to be poised, and let the investigation play out. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, 60 seconds. Well, that hate crime, we've had hate crimes in Bloomington before. That hate crime was abominable, uh, and the, the Bloomington has in our DNA, though, the celebration of diversity that, uh, that is so deep and so powerful that the, I was at a march on Saturday uh, with a lot of people talking about the importance of religious diversity in the community, celebrating that. Um, you know, our community is so much stronger because of all the people who come here from all over the world. They come as faculty members, they come as students, they come as residents and business owners, and uh, their kids go to our schools. Uh, they, they, they make Bloomington so much better. Uh, and it is important uh, that the leadership in the City Hall make clear that diversity is in our DNA. Uh, it, it was a beautiful thing to see the response of the community uh, to that kind of hate crime. Uh, and I think it's powerful message that we send that says that's not our city uh, and we're stronger for all the diversity that we Mr. have. Mr. Turnbull, will you have 30 seconds? Yeah, I just want to mention I don't think it's a chronic uh, thing. Uh, I, I do think, um, you know, this town is getting more and more diverse with Indiana University bringing in the um, international flair that's not going to stop, it looks like. <clears throat> the out-of-state demographics and the students of greater wealth, it looks like it's not going to uh, slow down. So um, it, it is getting more diverse, and I, I think it's an isolated incident. I certainly hope it is. Okay, moving on. IU Health Bloomington will soon be relocating to the current site of the IU driving range. What's your vision for the soon-to-be vacant hospital site on 2nd Street? Mr. Hamilton, 90 seconds. Thank you. Well, that, that is a big issue for our community. Um, IU Health is one of the largest employers in our city, uh, right behind IU, and uh, their move is, re is very important. Um, it's going to create a big change on the east side where the new hospital gets built. It'll take about four or five years from what we have been told, what we understand for that new hospital to be ready, a new medical center. And that's going to create opportunities on the east side uh, for new development uh, and new, new sustainable neighborhoods and connectivity and, and uh, vitality. What's left on the west side when that closes is a big challenge. We have uh, the hospital, IU Health, has about 25 acres. They own it. Uh, we have about another 25 acres that are privately held medical offices around the hospital uh, and there's, a, there's a, a task force that's been created to look at that. I think it's very important and as mayor I'll work very closely with IU Health to try to talk about what can be done. Uh, I think it can create opportunities for affordable housing, a new neighborhood, can make some job opportunities there along with other things on the near west side like the Tech Park and, and Switchyard Park that kind of line up along that axis, uh, we have a real chance to do some interesting things in the city. We have time. Uh, I'm going to have an open door and an open ear to think about what ought to be done and we have to work very closely with the university on that to try to make good decisions. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, 60. Well again, back to aesthetics a little bit. You see, Indiana University knows their number one recruiting tool is a beautiful campus and the aesthetics with the parents, with the students, and so on and so forth. And so uh, I do think that it's very important that it looks nice, whatever is there. I'm not too worried about it because I think it flows really nice with the Beeline Trail, the potential for the Convention Center expansion, or I'm not necessarily saying that's going to happen, but I do think it can be all a piece of the puzzle. But <clears throat> how a place looks translates into how people feel. So we need to make sure that whatever's there, again, remembering the hospital owns that property. But I don't, I'm not really all that concerned with uh, what's going to happen. When you're in a community like uh, Richmond, Indiana, that doesn't, isn't as vibrant and they lose a downtown location, bad things can happen. But I think there's going to be a whole lot of positive that's going to come out of it. Mr. Hamilton, 30 seconds to comment. Well, I, I am optimistic about it. Uh, I think, however, it's very important to look at some of the other communities where these things have happened. I think it's critical that the mayor, uh, along with other public leaders, work very closely with IU to talk about this. I met with Mark Moore, the president of, the, of IU Health, and some of his board members, and I said, here's what I hope, here's what I want. 
I want in 25 years for people to look back and say we did it right. And I think if we can work together with them to get it right, that's the task. Okay, thank you. We're going to go to our live tweeting. We had someone just now tweet in, California has outlawed the retail use of thin film plastic bags. What do you think we can do to benefit the environment? And we will go to 90 seconds for Turnbull. I went on the tour in Mount Vernon last week. It was very interesting. I must tell you, if you saw the industry of the 1.5 cent plastic bags, it would be dramatic. Uh, there's basically two football fields of energy use and machines and, and everything. Uh, one, 1 1.5 cent plastic bags is a big business. Uh, on the flip side, paper bags are about six cents a piece. So <clears throat> I don't know how it's gonna play out. I will say I personally am not throwing away plastic bags now. Uh, I have bought my reusable bags, um, and, and I'm not so sure we have to sell it exclusively on the environment. You would be absolutely amazed at how much energy it takes to produce these bags and, and so on. They, re, they recycle about 30% of the bags. The colored bags are the recycled bags. They're either brown or they're grayish. The white bags, like a Target bag, for example, has zero recycle in it. So. <clears throat> a lot of communities have, have done it. It's either a voluntary thing or a ban, maybe. I don't know where we land, but uh, if I could take all of you to a factory like that, I do think it would impact your life. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, you have 60 seconds. We need leadership on the environment. The environment is a, is a, it's a very important issue. Uh, I'm proud that I was the first chair of the Sustainability Commission in the city of Bloomington. Uh, we worked hard to figure out what are the things the city can do to improve our environment, lower our carbon footprint. I've already pledged to put solar panels on City Hall. Uh, I was an advocate uh, against Governor Pence on the, his fighting the clean energy plan, which is a smart thing to do around the country, and our, our governors oppose it, and having mayors stand up and say, no, this is the right thing to do, I think is important. Um, I, I'll work very closely on environmental issues because I think we need to be a leader in this community about environmental issues. Plastic bags, I think nationally the figure is like 2% of them are recycled or something. It's, some ter it's a terribly low number. It is certainly something to look at. I know there's a group in Bloomington that's exploring this and I look forward to working with them on it. It would go to city council and I think showing Bloomington taking tangible steps to show we care about the environment is critical. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, you get 30. Yeah, I, I also was in discussions with some of the people that are on the task force of this and tried to remind them that Americans are generally rather lazy. Convenience is a big factor for them. So in a presentation or at least some um, <clears throat> uh, understanding that there's a whole segment of this population that really is only thinking about their convenience. So how do we get the message across or how do we approach that to maybe uh, work together on the whole thing. Okay, let's talk about parking. <laughs> Would you make any changes to Bloomington's downtown parking plan? We begin with 90 seconds with Mr. Hamilton. Well, um, we, can, we can go back in time and, and remember the, um, the uh, installation of the meters. Um, uh, it's not been a secret in my campaign. I, I have said that I would not have voted for the parking meters at the time, uh, primarily because I think it's very important when putting a new policy in place like that, whether it's parking meters or plastic bags or other things, it's really important as a city to say, here's what we're trying to accomplish, here's the problem we're trying to fix, here's how we're going to solve it, and here's how we're going to evaluate whether it's working or not. And I don't think we were clear enough about that. How, is it really working? Um, we have made changes, the city council has made changes to the parking meter times. Um, I'll look forward to continuing to explore that. Uh, number one, if data shows that those parking meters are hurting the downtown economy, we need to take a look because the downtown economy is very, very important. Um, I do think our three parking garages, we some would say we've got the most complicated parking garage rules in the state. Uh, they're, they're really tricky. People sometimes pull up and look at the sign and then they back out because it's too complicated. So we need to simplify things, make it easy for people to, uh, to use. Um, 
it is an important source of revenue at this point for the cities, uh, though, though we need to be clear about where the revenue is going. To, so I, I'll throw the door open on that. You'll see what the revenue is, where it's coming from, and where it's being used, and we'll work together to use it as well as we can or change it if we need to. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, 60. Well, in a city that has residents downtown, then you're going to have some parking issues. And <clears throat> in my door-to-door -door downtown, I found no consensus on the issue. I, it, it was almost like I asked 10 people and I got 10 different answers, although I don't think there are 10 different solutions. So I was really surprised by that. Um, I will say you have to deal with, it's a capacity issue. If people live downtown and they are gonna warehouse their cars, whether they bring friends over or whatnot, it's a very important to move that traffic in certain areas. So it, they were put in for the retail, for the business, businesses downtown. Um, I guess to answer your question, I, I am in favor of it at this point. I do think, I grew up near Ann Arbor, I do think their solution is a little bit better. That is, there weren't parking meters, there's numbers on the slots and you can actually pay remotely or at a central station. I think that's a good thing. But the book Walkable City really addresses parking and I think it, I always recommend people read that book. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, you have 30. Well, <clears throat> I think... Um, we need to do all we can to help make this city walkable, bikeable, to increase the, um, the ease of that. We'll, we'll invest a lot in that as we go forward, as we have been doing. You know, there may be some tweaks needed. I was talking to um, a teacher at Ivy Tech at the Waldron facility, and she said her students, if the garage was full, it, it was a pretty big tuition hike, effectively, if a student had to pay for parking every time. And you certainly don't want to deter people from that kind of thing. So I'll keep listening and looking uh, into how we can improve it. Okay, we're going to move along to another audience member who has the next question. Ryan Chatty, go ahead. Urban sprawl is an issue within any large community. Those within the millennial generation want to be able to live in a vibrant downtown that offers them the ability to walk or take the bus to their place of employment, to a restaurant, or to a night on the town. What is your plan to control urban sprawl while encouraging growth within the city? And Mr. Turnbull, you get to go first, 90 seconds. Ryan, thank you very much for that question because I, I, I think this is one big difference between John Hamilton and myself. He's spoken often about stopping the growth downtown and stopping the building downtown. But then in the other cheek, he talks about affordable housing. And if you restrict the supply, then the price is going to go up. I am fine with density. Um, there is a great urban, I totally agree with you, Ryan, there's a great urban movement. People want to be close to amenities, they want to be close to walkable places and so on and so forth. It's the question of how does the density look? There isn't anything more sustainable than putting people close to where they work or where they go to school. That's the most sustainable thing you can do. So I would advocate more plazas. We, we're not going to be Paris, France. That's a little bit of exaggeration, but it doesn't mean we can't look very, very nice. Plazas, more setbacks. I, I'm sorry, but Smallwood is not an impressive architecture. It's Lego architecture. I could have done it. I don't have a stamp for architecture, but I could have designed that building. It's only a glorified dorm, and many of them are glorified dorms, where John has said inclusionary zoning, I'll put a single mother with children in a Smallwood, which makes absolutely no sense, and nobody wants to live there. That's an adult. But it's about look, and, you, and, and studies show that a mixed architecture of very contemporary versus very old makes people feel very well. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, 60 seconds. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Good question. Ur urban sprawl is um, really important. Uh, the first thing to talk about is we have to work very closely with our county friends, uh, and not even just our county in Monroe County, but the regional uh, connections that we have. We need to make Bloomington uh, a leader of this region and help the development plan be not just our city because we can't we can't build a wall around Bloomington and hope we do it right and then not not work with what's going to happen around us so that's really important. John I've never said stop building downtown I've said build the right things downtown I've said we should not have had a wild spree of market rate housing what I have said is Yes, we want people living downtown, but you know what? We need to have a diversity of housing types downtown. Inclusionary zoning is a simple strategy used all across the country that helps, that means if a developer is going to put a building in, either in that building or next door or in cash, they support affordable housing at the same time. We need to make Bloomington work for people of all walks of life. That's really important, and I'll be an active gov government to help make that happen. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, 30 seconds. Um, John is correct. He did say the word overbuilt. Downtown was overbuilt, and that was clear. Um, 
I think that inclusionary zoning is never going to pass in Bloomington, and I've offered a thousand dollars to John's charity if it ever did. It I won't pass the that, it won't pass the governing bodies. It didn't in Madison, Wisconsin, and it won't in Bloomington. Um, you, the real estate of business and market will come out with absolute guns as well as the Chamber of Commerce. So there's other ways to address it. You increase the supply, make the permitting much easier, and that increases the okay, supply. Okay, we have our next question from Sarah Ryderband. Bloomington City Council recently passed a resolution in support of Planned Parenthood. Where do you stand on support for Planned Parenthood and Right to Life? We begin with Mr. Hamilton, 90 seconds. Well, I'm a proud supporter of, of Planned Parenthood, uh, which for 99 years has been helping our nation uh, and for more than 50 years helping our city, our community, uh, protect freedom and, and opportunity for all of us, uh, in particular for women, uh, but all of us to help make that happen. I'm really proud that this city supports uh, the, the, the funding of a place like that that helps what they mostly do, the vast majority of what they do is help people uh, decide what their future is going to be and to control their parenting and decide when to be a parent or not to be a parent. They do sexually transmitted disease screenings. They're incredibly important for, for uh, people with, uh, without as much money to get the health screening that they need. So I'm a strong supporter of that. Um, all my life I've also been a supporter of, uh, of um, the right to choose. Uh, my wife and I have worked uh, to expand equality and justice and opportunity for folks, and that's been a key part of that. Uh, it is a, I know there are issues that divide us on that to some degree. Uh, there are certainly different viewpoints about that. I, I'm clear about my view about the right to choose. I would say, however, I think Planned Parenthood is a very important medical provider in our community, and I'm proud to have stood with the city council to support the funding for Planned Parenthood. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, you have 60 seconds. Yeah, I've never understood a, a bunch of males deciding what females should do or don't do with their body. I, uh, I don't get that. Um, I, I am in favor of Planned Parenthood. However, I will say this. Um, uh, the city council, I, I am concerned about their, um, I wouldn't say obsession, but over-occupation with resolutions um, that are mailed off to places, and I'm not even sure they're opened. I would prefer that they spend their time on more meaty issues, more tougher issues, things like uh, panhandling downtown or the crows downtown or the look of the downtown and currently the yard sign free for all in the public medians is really embarrassing. It's against the sign ordinance, but nobody in the administration is doing anything about it. But regardless, to answer your question, I'm, I'm very in favor of Planned Parenthood. It's done, it's done wonderful things for us. It's not a city issue per se, but it's still the answer. Stop there. Mr. Hamilton, 30 seconds. It, it actually is a city issue. It's very important. Uh, the local Planned Parenthood served 4,000 people last year, mostly people without a lot of resources, and our governor is trying to shut down Planned Parenthood, and all across the country people are trying to shut down Planned Parenthood, and I don't think, I think it's good the city council stood up uh, and as mayor, I certainly would support him to stand up and say, this isn't, a, this isn't some resolution. This is, this is funding and support for an organization that's very important to our community that's under attack from other sides. Okay, we're going to go back to our Twitter. We have people listening and watching that want to be part of this debate as well. This is from Jessica Gall Myrick. What policies would you support to prevent the heroin HIV outbreaks that are hitting other Indiana cities? And we, get, we begin with Mr. Turnbull. You have 90. Uh, Joe, honestly, I haven't studied that issue um, hardly at all. I do know there is some trouble down south of the, of the state. Um, I, I, I would really have to defer to Mike Decoff and, and the, the police area that is more familiar with how much activity there is and how much uh, trouble we might be in. So uh, I, I'm just going to be honest that I don't know what policies have been most effective at this point, but it is certain uh, that it's a rather slow-growing cancer, so to speak, for a lot of communities, and it needs to be attended to. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, 60 seconds. Well, P Planned Parenthood is an important partner in this to try to help people get testing and deal with those uh, diseases. It's an example of why that organization is very important. 
you know, I, I'm pleased the firefighters have, have supported me uh, in this race, and, and I know that now the firefighters in Bloomington are carrying the drug, I, I think it's called Narvon, that's, a, that's used to revive overdose victims. Um, it's, a, it's a very important issue. Um, I'm not a public health official. I did run the State Family and Social Services Administration. I know how strong and good the public, of, the public health officials that we have are. So uh, I certainly would work closely with them to look at what we can do on this issue. Uh, getting ahead of it is important, uh, not getting behind it, being able to talk about how it's happening and why it's happening and have public debate about it and talk about it. Uh, and as your mayor, I'd, I'll, uh, I'll be working regionally on those issues. Um, that's, that's, it's, it's a public safety issue and we need to address it aggressively. Mr. Turnbull, would you like your 30-second comment? I would. I do think it's just disingenuous to say that you have a blanket endorsement from the firefighters. I know ver several of them. I've worked with them. I've coached with them in hockey. I know. I know which way they're going to vote, and they're going to. You know, they're not going to vote single-handedly for one candidate. So I did want to mention that. But <clears throat> um, I really, yeah, it, it's a, a complicated issue that I think needs studying, and I, I would not profess to say that I've uh, spent enough time on that issue. Crime on Kirkwood Avenue is up, and some say aggressive panhandling is to blame. Is this an issue and something you feel would be a priority if elected mayor? Mr. Hamilton, you have 90 seconds. Thanks. Uh, John, the, the firefighters union endorsed me, so that's, they, they took a vote, and over two-thirds of them did, so they certainly can all vote their own way, uh, and I encourage them to do that and, and look forward to working with them. Um, you know, violent crime has increased in Bloomington. Uh, overall in the country, violent crime has been going down for the last 10, 20 years. Um, we've seen a little bit of bump over the last few years. That's very important. I've met with Chief Decoff to talk about that. Um, we, we need first to talk about it as a community. Where is it happening? How is it happening? One of the first things I'll do is make sure all that data is available. You should be able to go online into the city database and see anything you want to know about public safety activities. Uh, again, it's, it's your government and that, all, that information should come out. Aggressive panhandling um, and, and the poor uh, is an issue. I was the chair of the Shalom Center board. Uh, I just recently resigned from there, but I was there for a couple of years as the chair. Uh, homelessness and panhandling are, are not the same thing. They're, they're related. Uh, I, think, I think we can look to other cities and see what they're doing well. For example, uh, one of the issues is I hate to have people not have their generous um, impulses. Those are good, generous impulses. But maybe we could have a voucher or some way to give support to a panhandler to let them get food or drink if you want rather than cash. There are other cities that are doing interesting things like that. I'll get a group of people together and we'll talk about how to improve our city and clean that up. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, 60 seconds. Well, the direct answer for me is that panhandling is, it gets more aggressive as it is ignored. Uh, it will never happen on IU's property because they realize the aesthetic element of it. It goes overwhelmingly towards addiction. We've got the food thing covered in the town. We've got meals covered. It's in, I know the couple down by uh, South Kroger near the Wendy's, and it's heroin. Heroin is, it goes directly towards heroin. And I would be the one that would deal with panhandling directly, and John has said he's looking for other creative ways, but it's very easy, actually. Um, other communities have uh, geographically restricted it. It's come under some legal challenges in some other communities, but there are other ways to deal with it, too. It's a no, it's a lose-lose for everyone. There's nothing good that comes from panhandling, and I would also uh, relate to a greater presence of police down on Kirkwood to stop all kinds of crime. Mr. Hamilton, 30 seconds. You can't, you can't legislate that panhandlers go away. Uh, you can do some restrictions, but you can't, you, it doesn't solve the problem just to push them out of eyesight. It's a problem we need to fix. It's a problem that does reflect need for addiction services. We don't have a detox center in Bloomington. That's something we ought to work on together with the hospital, Centerstone, other partners. There are people who are, who, who, are, who are without money. There are people who have addictions, and we need to help, help work on that. But this is not a problem in Bloomington values, in my view, that you just try to push and hide. You fix it. Uh, we received this question earlier. Gloria Leck sent this in. What plans do you have for better serving the needs of seniors and retired members of the community? And Mr. Turnbull, you begin. Well, first, um, 
You know, there has been some, a lot of studies on seniors, and no community is going to an exclusive senior uh, a center uh, that is run by the public. Um, we have great uh, options for seniors in the YMCA and the Twin Lakes Recreation Center. I work for the Parks Department, so I have to give that plug. Uh, we have a very vibrant group that plays pickleball there and uh, does walks around the track and so on and so forth. But it's found that seniors like to mix with young people. It gives them energy. It gives them a, a sense of purpose. Um, I, my, uh, a few specifics on the seniors. I do think that bus access is very important and they need to be encouraged to ride the bus more often. They often think that there's an element of people on the bus that they don't want to mix with, but I can tell you I ride the four and the five and the six limited bus and it's a great experience. It's a connector for people. Um, and you know, the seniors that come here and retire here have great wealth, so it's a great thing for the community. And I would also say, I do believe that senior corps or senior cadets that work in other communities that go into schools and read with the kids and interact with kids, I would love to see that happen in Bloomington. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, you have 60 seconds to respond. Well, we have seniors of all kinds of incomes in Bloomington. We have some seniors that are very well off, but we have a lot of seniors that aren't so well off. And it's very important that our community work for all those seniors. Um, uh, my mother-in-law moved here from New York. She's at Beltrace High, Carolyn. I don't know if you're watching, but uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, she and many seniors do move to town. Uh, we need to make sure transportation is good. I agree with John about the transportation system. Housing is important. Affordable housing for seniors is very important. That doesn't happen automatically. We can help increase that. Healthcare access, the move of the hospital is a little bit of a threat to that. Um, and then engaging seniors, um, we have a terrific Area 10 agency on aging that helps create programs and opportunities for seniors. I'll work closely with them. Um, we did lose the Downtown Senior Center. I will be having, I want to announce uh, the plans to have a senior internship in the city. I would love to get 10 or 12 seniors with expertise to give us a year in the city of your part-time expertise to help us do things well. I think that would be fun. Mr. Turnbull, 30 seconds. Oh, I yeah, anytime you get seniors engaged is, is great. I, I would be all in favor of, of something of that sort. It really brings a lot of value, and, and, and I'm not far away from it, I don't think. <laughs> and uh, I, I would want to stay connected to young people. I would want to stay connected to my family. I would want to give back to the community in any way that I could. Okay, we go back to our audience with Abby Gitlitz. Go ahead with your question. So Bloomington as a community is strongly invested in the arts and it generates a lot of income for the city. Please tell me specifically how you plan to support the, and encourage the arts in Bloomington and how you see BEAD, the Bloomington Entertainment and Arts District, working with your plan. Mr. Hamilton, 90 seconds. Thanks. Uh, it is wonderful to think about the arts in Bloomington. We had uh, in the spring primary, there were some special events where we got to talk about the arts and how important they are in Bloomington. My wife Dawn and I uh, love to go to the theater and the festivals and the park uh, music uh, activities and, you know, just walk. This is an amazing community. Our kids, you can get lessons from some of the best musicians in the world uh, when you have kids growing up in Bloomington, what a, what a treat it is. And Mayor Cruzan has been very strong and I think very effective with the City Council to recognize good arts are part of good economic development, good jobs, a good city. Uh, and we do that well. We've had good leadership uh, from the arts, uh, Maya Michelson, who just got promoted to a big, bigger job up in Indianapolis, so that's an important position to keep, keep uh, to refill and to support uh, helping local artists again Affordable housing is important for local artists. It's important that we have a community with different housing options. Well, I'd love to see tiny houses available in the city so people who want to live lighter on the land don't want to have to spend as much on housing can do that or co-op communities. So there are lots of things we can do. The bus Kirk Chumley is an anchor in the community. Uh, I'll work very closely. I've already been meeting to think about ways we can strengthen the bus Kirk Chumley. Uh, such, it's a beautiful theater that was saved by the city stepping in. Um, we have wonderful festivals, uh, 4th Street, uh, Lotus, others, to make sure we, maybe we should have more of those. So my ears are open about that. Mr. Turnbull, 60 seconds. Abby, I think you said specifically. So I'm going to give you some specifics, if you don't mind. 
Um, I think Maya Michelson's position needs to be refilled. Maya is a neighbor of mine, and she was very effective. And Maya, if you're watching, I know uh, how you feel about voting for your neighbor. Um, and she was very balanced and very good with what she did, and I'm sure that we can find someone to replace her. Buskirk Chumley Investment, I, I currently believe in, the, I believe in the current agreement. Basically, I don't know if you know about the agreement, but basically the Parks Department takes care of all the infrastructure, and there's a management firm that takes care of all the productions and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> I do think my artwork is better than John Hamilton's, no, and I will minute. back wait that up. I, I have a, a finalist in the, in the Grand Rapids uh, Art Prize, and I do think we can do Art Prize here in Bloomington. You should look it up. It's, it's uh, supported by Amway, and it's a great program. And I do think there should be a co-op for artists in this town. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, 30 seconds. All right, I haven't seen your art, John, but I'll, I'll have a sing-off with you. Will, you, 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 you can do a visual art. I'm a, I'm a singer. I love to, I love to sing. Um, you know, the arts are in the DNA of our community. Uh, we, we, are, we are more interesting, we're more creative, we're more innovative. Uh, young job creators want to be in a place with a lot of artists. In fact, I was talking to a local company and said, what can we do? And they said, you know, it would be great to have a busker festival. They saw one in Europe, you know. Arts and, arts and creativity and innovation relate. We need to make sure the city keeps working for artists, both with space and housing. Do you support the use of tax abatements, and how do you think they help or hurt our local economy? Mr. Turnbull, 90 seconds. I do. I think tax abatements are a recruiting tool. I think they have to be used as a preemptive measure. They have to be used as a recruiter on the front end. I think often they're used as an afterthought and somebody is not on top of them. So really, it, it's back to action. It's back to a staff that is aggressive and on top of things and not one that the free market or someone else sees, oh, there's an abatement, and now that would be even a sweeter deal for us. I think it's, again, it, it's, it's more of, a, in a game of sports, it's more of an offensive tool than it is a defensive tool. Mr. Hamilton? Well, tax abatements are really, they're a form of public subsidy, right? Giving, giving public subsidy to a private entity in order to accomplish something. The most important thing is that we're really careful and think about what are we getting for that subsidy. Um, one of the reasons I came out last week, uh, 10 days ago, with questions and criticism about the Tech Park proposal, and we don't have all the details yet, but we were talking about giving a very large subsidy to a private developer to put up 225 market rate apartments right downtown in the middle of the tech park. I don't, think, I don't think that's the right way to use public subsidies. I've said we should use the public subsidies to support the jobs that are very hard to bring in. And I promise if we get those jobs, you will have market rate housing come. So abatements are one example of public subsidy. And the, the most important thing is just to be, make, be very sure that if we're going to put public subsidy in, like we did with the Beeline Trail, terrific. But make sure we're getting the right thing for that subsidy. Mr. Turnbull, 30 seconds. Well, uh, again, I think that um, a mixed use downtown is perfect. And John does mention a restriction on building again. I think the tech park situation is really a perfect, a perfect thing. It could have a co-op in there for artists as well. It is a form of a sort of a, an abatement type uh, motivator. It's got a nice mixed use. It'll make the downtown look great. I think Denise Alonzo's done a wonderful job with it. Okay, we're going to move along to a Twitter question that just came in. What is your plan to improve east-west traffic flow? And Mr. Hamilton, you begin. Well, first, let me, let me come back. John, um, I, guess, I guess, yeah, the answer is I do believe in restrictions on building. I mean, I think the public government wants to, wants to have a say in how buildings are built. You do, too. You want to control how they look. You talk about aesthetics. That's really important. I care, I, aesthetics are really important to me, too. But more than just aesthetics, it's really important that we protect the affordability of units so that people of all walks of life can still enjoy this city. There's some risk that we will become a, a tale of two cities, and we need to work very hard to, to protect against that. Um, East-west east traffic flow, um, you know, that's kind of a, a, a long-standing uh, issue with the city. Uh, they're, they're, I'm not going to go into to the details of each street. I will say this. Probably the most important thing going on over the next year is going to be the growth policies plan. 
which is a long phrase to describe an important process where the community talks about how do we want to grow. How, where are people going to be? How are they going to get from place A to place B, east to west, north to south, in to out, uh, jobs, uh, all that. That is a big dialogue. It's, it's begun. And, and as, a, as a mayor, I'll look forward to that. We need to have all modes of getting in and around and around uh, about our city, walking, bicycling, cars, buses. We have four bus systems. We need to integrate them better. Uh, and as mayor, I'll work very hard to try to make sure that's a public process to, to envision where we go. Okay, Mr. Turnbull, 60 seconds. Well, I don't have a specific plan for an east-west traffic uh, plan. I will say this, I've always been intrigued by Indiana and Bloomington specifically ignoring east-west travel. I've never really figured it out. Seems like north-south, we've got it down, but uh, I don't know how people come from Columbus or from the west side for a football game, for example. It mystifies me. Um, I, do, I do recognize that uh, multi-roads and multi-connectivity is very important to spreading the traffic out. Um, so not just one artery of, for example, 2nd Street or 3rd Street is a solution, but a multi-approach. Um, I totally agree with John. It's one of my biggest points is that growth is, is very important. It almost astounds me that all the meetings I've been to and all the interactions, nobody has mentioned I-69. It's coming, it's going to be soon. How it looks, how the entrance and how the exit looks is very critical for us. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, you have 30 seconds. Well, I, just, I, I want to bring back the issue of regional connection. Um, sometimes in Bloomington, we, we, you know, we, we control Bloomington, but we have to relate very well to the regions around us. East-west east, west travel doesn't stop at our city, our city uh, borders. Um, we need to work very well with the county. We need to work well with the city, I mean the state. Uh, I, I was a, in state government a couple different times. I know how those uh, agencies work, and it's very important as mayor that we have somebody who can collaborate well with all of them. Okay, moving on. Downtown businesses say that the winter crow infestation is becoming a bigger problem year after year. How big of an issue is this, and in what ways would you go about handling that issue, Mr. Turnbull? I didn't plant that question, but it's a big deal with me. I mean, I went downtown in February, and, and I was disgusted by the lack of action on it. It's a huge aesthetic issue. Um, to have a visitor or anyone go downtown and your car basically ruined, and it was like raining on me. It, it, it really was. Um, it's not hard to solve. It, it, it's embarrassing that there was no action on it, and it's also embarrassing that it's on the the impetus of the retailers or somebody in the community that's a business person that has to bring the dialogue up. Um, people have studied it all over the world. It's pretty darn easy. You make them feel uncomfortable. You can do that with, and you have to do it with a multi-approach. Uh, strobe lighting, noise, effigies, if it gets even worse, you may have to spray them with water. But uh, solving the crow problem is a whole lot easier than solving the urban deer problem. I'm sorry I brought up the word deer. John, you probably don't like it either, and I, I don't either. But um, it's a lot easier solution, believe me, and we need to do it. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, 60 seconds. Well, I, I was at a meeting downtown uh, that was led by local business and civic leaders and others and community. Uh, city leaders were there as well to talk about the crows. Um, it's not, it's not one of our most uh, pressing issues, but it's one we can fix. Um, the city of Indianapolis has dealt with this for a number of years. They do spend about $100,000, $150,000 a year, so it's not like you can snap your fingers to get them, uh, to get them out. Uh, one idea I'll, I'll share, the city of Indianapolis hired some folks to come down from West Lafayette, uh, experts to come down and do it. Uh, I did ask at this session, I said, well, can't we train the local folks here to do that rather than drive down every day to do this, which they're doing for months at a time from West Lafayette, which may be, it's a, I don't know if they'd be welcome here. I'm sure they would be welcome here from West Lafayette. But uh, it's an issue we can fix. Uh, it does take collaboration between the private sector and the public sector, uh, and uh, we can get this done. Okay, 30 second uh, comment. I really, I don't have anything more on it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty easy solution. It's not a snap of the fingers. It does take maintenance. It does take time, but it can happen. Okay. We are down to our last question. We're running out of time. Uh, 
let's start with um, how would you like to see Bloomington change over the next five years if you were mayor? So we will begin with Mr. Hamilton, 90 seconds. Well, this is a terrific city. We're all lucky to be here. Uh, we enjoy it. Uh, as I said at the outset, we can't take anything for granted. We have to take some steps. So I think over the next five years, uh, it's really important that we build our digital infrastructure. Uh, we don't want to be left behind. Jasper, in three years, will have citywide broadband gigabit speed internet. We need to take steps to make sure we're not behind. We have one of the best informatic schools in the world, and we need to have uh, the best digital infrastructure and infrastructure that won't leave people behind. Because right now we're getting redlined about that. So having that kind of infrastructure for job growth. I do believe having ta taken steps, we'll see progress on affordable housing so that we indeed do see as buildings, are, as buildings happen and density happens, which is a good thing, that we're protecting affordability for people all across the city. We haven't talked about education. I served on the school board here. I love that. Uh, my kids went through the public school system. I think in five years we'll have a good partnership, working city government, school system, the region, seniors, others, to help. The school systems are under attack. Uh, public school teachers have, for, have been demonized by some of the politicians, particularly in, in Indianapolis, uh, and I'll look forward to working with them. So good housing, good jobs coming, digital infrastructure, uh, good schools, uh, and, and more and more arts. We'll have more fun every day uh, with all the creativity in Bloomington. Okay, 60 seconds. Mr. Turnbull. Well, in five years, I would hope that Bloomington, if I were fortunate enough to be mayor, would be much more proud of, of their city. And the reason why they would be proud of their city is because it would look nicer. When you're in high demand, with Indiana University going to be over 50,000 students in not too long, and the demographics they're bringing in and the international element, um, you have to plan for that, and you have to manage that. Um, so I would be on IU's doorstep saying, who are you bringing in? How many are you bringing in? What is their demographics? And when you're in high demand of a city, you can make it look how you want it to look. You can tell the builders, this is what we want it to look like. This is where we want it to sit. And believe me, uh, the, the better a place looks, the better you feel about it. It makes everybody um, much happier and much prouder. I would like to see more action on, on elements, and I also would like to see more balance within the city government so more things get okay, done. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, 30 seconds coming. We, we are proud of our city. This is a great city. We just have to make sure it works for everybody and that we keep progressing. And, and John, I, international students, the, the more diversity we have as a community, every time we get more diversity, we get better all kinds of diversity. It's happened through our history and I hope very much it will continue to happen. It seems to me that's in the DNA. And, and I use a great partner and the way we, we connect with the world makes all of us, all of our kids, all of us uh, better citizens. All right, and we're down to our two minute closing statements. And Mr. Turnbull, you get to go first. Thank you, Joe. I want to mention what I think is missing from all the conversation of the mayor. And that is that my senior management staff is going to be a home run. It's going to be an absolute uh, game changer. I think my deputy mayor will be uh, a person you'll want to interact with and do business with, as well as all the people that come uh, under my staff. They'll be evaluated. They'll be uh, access to me. We'll meet on a weekly basis, one-to-one, -one, and uh, that is a new concept for this town. Um, this election has never been about me when I've been in it. It's been about unlocking people power. I, politicians want to be in every picture. They want to have their name on all the stationery. They got to have their name on the web page. And I am not about that. I'm about unlocking people power so they touch your lives. Um, there are some very, on websites for Bloomington, you often see one of the greatest elements is the creative, healthy, and ambitious people that are in this town. And I intend to use those creative, ambitious, and healthy people and have them a part of the government and have them come into the government, have them come into my office and do great things. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, two minute closing statement. Well, again, thank you WTIU, WFIU for putting this on and getting this all dolled up and making everybody uh, get a chance to hear about the mayoral 
uh, debate. Uh, and thank you all for being here in the audience. Thank you for listening at home, for watching at home, paying attention to your community this way. It's a, it's a treat uh, to be able to run for mayor and, and get the chance to pitch, uh, pitch this chance. It's really like a job interview. Yes, you should look for experience. Uh, I mean, I've run two big state agencies. It is important what people you get together. You know, I'm really proud that the woman that I hired to run the Air Division of the state now runs the Air Division of the United States. She runs it for EPA. The woman I hired to run Medicaid for the state of Indiana was one of the top executives at the National Medicaid. She was really good. She got promoted. And a guy, a colleague of mine, just got promoted to be the White House Social Innovation Director. So it is, it is about getting good people. We have great people, and I'll keep finding even, even more people and encouraging who we have. So um, you've heard both candidates. We're, we're, we're both uh, earnest about the city. I think there are real differences. Uh, I think I care about government stepping in to solve some problems. It's not about politics. It's about leadership and bringing people together to fix affordable housing. You've heard my ideas, and there's plenty more on the website if you want, want more detail. It's about jobs, helping grow the jobs that we need in Bloomington. It's about affordable housing to make sure this city works for people from all walks of life. We've got to make Bloomington a place that works for people of all different backgrounds and approaches and interests. It's about public education, and it's about open government. I will, I will throw the doors open. You'll be able to see every penny that we spend in government. I want you to be able to find that quickly on the Internet. Uh, I'll be out every week. I'll be out with all the employees. You'll see me. Uh, you may get tired of seeing me. Uh, but listen, between now and November 3rd, if you want to volunteer, we'd love to have your involvement. Please do vote. The voting booth is open every day, Monday to Saturday uh, at, uh, on 7th Street. And November 3rd, um, John Hamilton, I hope you'll vote for okay. me for mayor. Thank Time you. is up. And our time is up. Thank you so much to the candidates for doing this and being with us this evening. And thank you for joining us this evening. Before you vote, join us for more election coverage at indianapublicmedia.org. There you can also find an archived video of this debate and questions that we couldn't get to during this broadcast, such, such as the deer population and some other items. And don't forget to join us on November 3rd for full election night coverage. We'll have live updates all night from reporters covering races in Bloomington, Terre Haute, and Kokomo. We'll have the latest results as well as interviews with the candidates. Again, you can join us at indianapublicmedia.org. Have a good night. Support for this program comes from our members. Thank you.